Yet, are not my sins those of circumstance? I came to this unfrequented place to find some ease, ease to the body, but ease to the mind, none. When I am alone, restless thoughts rush upon me like a swarm of hornets. The present time is past. What once I was, what now I am. I sit most of the day dreaming of the green mountains of Vermont, October in the main woods, blue lakes, the brown forests and the white rapids, my America. If only I could return to you. America denied to me. God grant that I may yet feel her soil beneath my feet and hold with these trembling hands the flag, the flag for which now I would give my life. How proud I was when I received my master's degree. I'm negligent of the lessons it taught. I am amazing. General Washington is amazing. Tomorrow I will write to him, write to him that I am a mason and demand that I may go to America to plead my cause before a just sonic tribunal. Ah, oh, fate, be kind, be kind a little while. To tomorrow we will write, write to General Washington. It is with peculiar pleasure, brethren, that I wield the gavel in the Masonic Lodge Room here in Virginia, where for 31 years I have endeavored to assist in building the structure of Freemasonry. Our meeting here tonight is due to the visit to this country of our dear brother, General Lafayette. Since his arrival to America in August, we have visited many cities of our country, and his reception with one round of great ovations. Now, on the eve of his return to France, he will spend a few days with me in Mount Vernon. Mount Vernon. These fellow soldiers and brother Masons have traveled from distant states and accompanied him as a mark of their affection and esteem. It gives me pleasure to introduce to you our good brother, whom all America delights to honor, General Lafayette.
in war and peace. Some of them were exciting and bright. Most were weary and gray. I have seen this man when victory rode with our armies, and we swept all before us. And I have seen him when the loss of battle the loss of our armies. Turned into the shadow of the tomb and shrouded us in despair. But through all those years, he was always the wise commander, the keen advisor, the generous friend, and the sincere mason. Only those who were with him in those days know the trials through which he passed. <laughs> Not all Americans were loyal in those days, no, no, no. There were many who were faint-hearted, and many more became, uh, how you say, lukewarm and discouraged. But you know how he handled this. Insofar as it was in his purview, he took all of the stations of the army and appointed masons to guard them. The stores, the food, the ammunition, the weapons, everything was under the care of masons. And then, for his personal advisors and closest generals, he, they were picked exclusively from the fraternity. So in that way, brethren, did Freemasonry contribute to America gaining her freedom. A month from now, my brethren, I shall have left your shoulders. Perhaps I may never return. <coughs> with my admiration and my esteem and my love goes out to all things in America and America. But more especially will I cherish and remember and love this great man. A great man. A great Mason. And a great American. To commemorate this August event, I have brought with me from La Belle France this Masonic Eden, which was made for me by my dear wife, the Marquise de Lorient, and given to President George Washington as my father in Mason. My dear brother, may I help you to please. Monsieur le Général, my dear friend, may you and your country advance in prosper under the guidance and the love of the great architect of the universe. Such words from one toward whom I feel the affection of a father fills me with the deepest emotions. I shall never forget my delight when General Lafayette, then barely 21 years of age, came to me and expressed his desires to learn the mysteries of Freemasonry. This apron shall ever be treasured among my dearest possessions, a memorial of our Masonic unity and service. And I shall hold grateful remembrance for the kindness of the gracious lady whose hands brought it. General Green, the brethren of honor you with a seat in the West, and I am sure the Virginia Masons will be very glad to hear what message you bring from our brethren in Massachusetts. I bring to the fraternity in Virginia the greetings of the Freemasons of Rhode Island. As your great leader Patrick Henry said a few years ago, we are no longer Virginians or Pennsylvanians or New Yorkers or New Englanders. We are Americans. 
General Knox, you now had the seat of honor in the South, and we hope you can tell us something of our brethren in Rhode Island. In my tour of duty with General Lafayette, I often regretted that more distinguished representatives of my state could not be present to represent our fraternity. However, Massachusetts Masons and Masonry have an honorable record during the earliest days of the late conflict. Under the guidance of our lamented past Grand Master, General Joseph Warren, who at the time of his untimely death was a provincial Grand Master, our good brother, John Hancock, who had been with us this evening, but he had left his duties as a member of the 10th Continental Congress, now in session at Trenton was also a source of deepest regret to good brother Paul Revere that a combination of events prevented him from leaving Boston at this time. And he asked me to give all Masons his most affectionate readings. Now, it may not be amiss for me to indulge in a slight, but perhaps significant, Masonic reminiscence. The names the 50 participants in the exploits of 73, when the tea was thrown overboard in Boston Harbor, have never been divulged, nor will you ever hear it from the lips of any man who participated in that venture. This, however, may be proper for me to say, that for the first time in its history, although it was their regular meeting night, there was no quorum present at the Lodge of St. Andrew, of which General Warren was past master, and Paul Revere, a zealous and active member. Worshipful Master, I think it would be of interest and profit to some of the younger brothers for an account given of our military lodges. During the eight years of our struggle, many of our best loved and most distinguished brethren received Masonic life, and whereby our craft was enabled to do much service for the country. I recall, for instance, that scarcely had we gathered at the Siege of Boston before an army lodge was opened at Roxburgh by Colonel Gridley, who was Deputy Grand Master of Massachusetts. You honored the lodge with your presence, General Washington, accompanied, I think, by two of your aides, although their identities have slipped my mind. I recall that meeting very well. One of those aides, who was in attendance with me, now sits at your right hand, Hamilton of New York, and the other was our right worshipful brother, Colonel Edmund Randolph. Deputy Grand Master of Virginia. There is an alarm, Mr. Master. Attend the alarm and ascertain its cause. Worshipful Master, it gives me great pleasure to present to you and to this lodge, Worshipful Brother Colonel Francis Cranston of England and Brother Baltimore, for whom he vouches. Your Masonic record, at 
least in part, is well known to us, Worship Brother Cranston, and we welcome you and invite you to us in the East. You too are welcome, Brother Bell Tower, and I ask that you take a place near General Knox in the South. General Gist, we will conduct our brother to the East. It gives me great pleasure to introduce to you our distinguished friend and brother, General Lafayette, who has also honored us with his presence here this evening. Although there was the fate of war that but two years ago we were enemies, I assure you that tonight you find yourself in the company of friends. I thank you, sir, for those sentiments which are such as I should expect from your lips. Colonel Belltower and I arrived in the city today on business for the Crown, and about an hour ago heard of your presence and that you were visiting this lodge, so we hastened hither. I have long desired, most eminent general and brother, to extend to you in person my appreciation for the courteous and fraternal act you performed soon after the evacuation of Philadelphia in June of 78. On the evening prior to the evacuation, a meeting was held at the British Lodge, in which I was master and which Colonel Belltower, then a captain in my regiment, was senior warden. While Lodge was in labor, Bird came to prepare for leaving the city. In the haste and confusion that followed, the paraphernalia and records of our Lodge were left behind, and I felt they were forever lost. Well, I cannot need to tell you what followed, but your brethren may not be so well informed. When your forces entered Philadelphia, the records of our lodge fell into their hands. I learned that you had them placed with your baggage train. And after the campaign in New Jersey, when our army had reached New York, you sent them to me from White Plains, under a flag of truce, with the Masonic message that the American army did not war against works of benevolence and charity. Since the war, I have had the honor of writing my acknowledgement of this act. But quill and ink cannot express the warmth of spoken words. And I determined, if fate ever made it possible, to thank you in person, not only for myself, but for Mason and England, which I assure you appreciate so fraternal a courtesy. It was nothing, worshipful brother. Nevertheless, I am glad that the spirit that prompted me kind of echo in your heart. As you entered, we were about to hear a few words regarding the military lodges in our armies. General Gist, as a master of military lodge, you were one of our most active brethren throughout the struggle. Will you tell us some of your experiences during that time? The event that stands out most distinctly in my Masonic career was the meeting of American Union Lodge held in Morristown late December 79 to observe the festival of St. John the Evangelist. As one of those present, who will recall the event. The exercises were filled with the spirit of patriotism and devotion to the cause of duty. After you and General Lafayette had retired on that evening, I was appointed chairman of a committee to communicate to all of the American Grand Lodges and propose to them, notwithstanding your formal refusal to accept the position of Grand Master of Virginia, that you be invited to become National Grand Master of the United States. I have always regretted that the exigencies of war and the unsettled conditions of those times prevented the matter from having been acted upon by all of the states. As a matter of interesting information, I might say that at the meeting to which I had referred, there were no less than 68 officers in the Continental Army. I recall, in addition to a number here tonight, our good brethren, General Philip Schuler of New York, General John Sullivan of New Hampshire, Colonel James Monroe of Virginia, and that forsworn and unhappy man whose name is never more uttered in a Masonic lodge. My dear General Gist, I also remember that occasion that you recollected. But for myself, it is lacking something. 
Perhaps it is the remembrance that we should pay to those who have gone before us and the reasons for which we are here. I personally find more to stimulate my memory when I think of the terrible year of 1777, when our army went into winter quarters at Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. Now, with all regard and respect to Mr. Payne, these were the times that tried men's souls and proved them, whether they were made of gold or dross. Those of you who were not there, can you just picture the hardships that befell the Continental Army? At the beginning of the winter, we had over 12,000 men under arms and ready to fight. It's the end of the same winter. Less than 4,300 answered the road calls. The soldiers had to live in little huts with no floors. It became necessary for them to sleep upon the cold, bare earth. Few, if any, had shoes, and even fewer had adequate clothing to protect them against the terrible cold of that hellish wind. There was little food, no horses. That was all right, because there was no wagons. And there was no money. No money. In order for the army to get supplies, it had to take certificates and produce them and then the Congress had to vote to redeem them. The most heinous thing of all, to my mind, was that in those days, in the midst of our struggle for freedom, one out of every three men, one out of every three, were still sympathizers with the British king, German George III and the Dutch and German farmers of the valley were all too interested in taking their food to Philadelphia, only 24 miles away, where the British would gratefully accept it and pay for it with their stolen gold. True statement it was when General Washington wrote his letter as a president sitting over the Continental Congress, then sitting in York, I believe, when he said, Nothing, sir, can equal their sufferings, except the be patience, and the fortitude with which the faithful part of the army endures them. Faithful part of the army, that, brethren, is the phrase to remember. The agony of his soldiers and the hopelessness of the war never left the mind of General George Washington not for one minute of any day. And so many of these trials and tribulations he had to suffer on his own. Because you see, although he did have a good staff with the army, it was necessary because of the British attacks to move some of them as far north as West Point and as far south as South Carolina. And there was no one there for him to trust and no one he could rely on himself and the great architect of the universe. And to make matters worse, I'm sure most of you here remember that at that time, there was a cabal insti instigated with Congress to have him removed from the command of the army. And the officers he thought he could most trust were turned out to be the ones plotting against him. Not you, my friend. I remember when my enemies offered you command for the new invasion of Canada. And you replied that you would accept it, provided you report only to me and receive orders only from me. It was a time when one did not know whom to trust. But for us, there was one certain for a firm foundation. One, that in masonry, there would be no treachery or guilt. But then, but then, it was discovered that a mason, British mason, doubt, but a mason nonetheless, was using his membership in the fraternity to spy on us. And further recall that you got this word of this matter to me at the time, Brother Washington. And I replied that I did not believe any of our brethren were guilty. I hope that Brother Lafayette is very sure of his facts. That is a very serious charge to make against British masonry. Yeah. 
General. Sir Francis, English knight, no. In the warmth of my expressions, I have completely felt that British ministers are honored guests here too. I do hope and pray that you will accept my humble apology for bringing up the matter that tapped with a dictated left side. Monsieur le colonel, On the contrary, I am desirous as any man of having so grave a charge investigated. It would be grateful if you or some other brother could now inform me as to the exact evidence that appeared to prove so serious an accusation. Worshipful Master, I find that I have forgotten an important matter which should have been attended to much earlier. May I be excused for a time? I shall endeavor to return. Stay, brother. It seems to me no errand could be so important as the solution to the mystery that has always surrounded the charge made by Brother Washington in 77 regarding the Masonic spy discovered at Valley Forge. As my senior warden at that time, I deputed to you the investigation within our ranks, which I asked you to make full and complete and such an investigation was made and produced no evidence whatever that the charges were true. From that day, I put the matter out of my mind, confident that it had no basis in fact, and in truth, at this moment, I scarcely recall any of the details. Then be seated, and we will hear them. If our American brethren would be so courteous, and will agree. Pennsylvania. The 
matter was at once investigated. We learned that Thomas Murdoch had been a Mason in good standing in Miles, Pennsylvania, Italian. But he had long since to possess or even need that patent. He was captured in August of 76 from General House East, New York, and was confined for some months aboard the prison ship Jersey. When finally relieved, he had so wasted away that he soon after died. Before his death, however, he informed his Masonic brother that on the day of his capture, he was brought before an officer, a, a captain in the British Army. He conversed with him Masonically, took his patent from him, and assured him by means of it he would secure his speedy freedom. He never again saw either the patent or the British officer. This seems almost incredible. It, it is incredible. Uh, you may recall, Sir Francis, that when General Washington sent you in Philadelphia, uh, Reach recounted these charges. You instructed me to ascertain what truth was in them. I was unable to learn that they had any foundation. No British Mason in New York in August of 76, or in or near Philadelphia in the winter of 77, and we knew them all, or we were in both places, was likely to have done such an act. Nor could I find that any Mason was then engaged in espionage for our army. And now that we have heard the story, permit me to depart. And leave me on end, I left certain papers and dispatches with them. That risk is very small, Brother Bell Tower. And to leave so soon would be hardly courteous. As you came with me, pray wait and depart in my company. It is humiliating to think that any British Mason could so demean himself, even in the stress of bitterness of war, as to use his connection with our craft to such an end. But investigations proved this false Marcus Murdoch had gained interest in the camp by exhibiting his patent to a Mason, a rather simple fellow, who was on guard at the outer fortification of Morgan's Virginia Rifle, and told him he was an American soldier desirous of visiting the lodge. This was early in the day and that unsophisticated Mason entertained him and allowed him to gain exactly the information that was left in the Tyler's hands. There is an alarm, worshipful master. Attend the alarm and ascertain its cause. In the ante room is a brother for whom Tyler can vouch, accompanied by a profane, well tried and worthy brother, asks that this document be handed to you at once.
are not harmed. By what seems to be a providential dispensation, there are several here tonight the very men before whom this place should come. If there is no objection, I will have them brought in and let them say a say. I conceive it to be our duty to let no man know unheard who bases his plea on Masonic justice, toleration, and charity. During his reception, the Lodge will be a refreshment, for he is unworthy to see even the semblance of the Lodge. Brother Hamilton, Brother Jerry, he will attend to that duty. General, there is a name that is not spoken where American Masons are gathered together. Yes, General. General Arnold. Benedict Arnold. Benedict Arnold the Mason. Seeking justice from those who have pledged themselves always to give justice. The war is over. There is peace between Great Britain and America. The wounds that were made during the conflict are being healed. Let my wound be healed also. That is my petition. <coughs> In this country, we're men of both beliefs, loyalists and revolutionists. Some of us saw right and wrong through different eyes than others. Some were Tories. Some were for the revolution. That day is past. You are forgiving the Tories. You are accepting them as good citizens of the states, even though during the conflict, they were loyal subjects of King George. Why should I be accepted from such an amnesty? Proceed. Listen. And listen coldly. Is this your vaunted Masonic charity that you receive a brother's plea with ear only and not with the heart? I may have erred. I did err. But now I ask that you let the dead past bury the dead. I know how I am hated on these shores. But I also know that were you as Masons to reach out your hands to me, in time my fault would be forgiven, if not quite forgotten. I appeal, I demand, that exception shall not be made of me. Other Tories, former enemies, British officers are welcome here today. Why not me? My services, even in the most humble capacity, are at your disposal. With these, my friends may feel I do not know. But in my heart, there is a vast, unbridgeable gulf between the British subject, who honestly opposed the colonists, and the American, who deserted his flag to become a servant of the enemy. Hard. Hard as always. Never, General Washington, did you recognize me as I deserved, and perhaps in that lies some explanation of my conduct. At a moment when I was serving the colonies with all my heart and soul, you rebuked me publicly. Not from any wish of mine, but by order of the court martial, which tried and sentenced you to the rebuke. But has it never entered your thought that there might be more than one story to the unfortunate happening at West Point? Oh! What happened at West Point was reviewed by a court martial of 14 Major and Brigadier Generals. The court martial which tried the unhappy Major John Andre. You have spoken here of justice. Was it justice to allow that brave young man to die when you could have saved his life? How? Oh, except at the risk of my own. There speaks the man that you ever were. Selfish, filled with pride of opinion, 
driven with an overweening ambition, impatient of counsel, admonition, or restraint, consumed with a hot and unreasoning jealousy. Enough. There sit here several members of that court martial, including General Green, who is present. I now ask him to speak. We were forced, under the rules of war, to condemn to death a youth whose only fault is that he recklessly served his king and trusted the protection of this false American. Had this man been willing to give the orders to the boatman to return him to his ship, Andre would have reached his own line safely, although at what cost to us. But his selfishness forbade it, and Andre had to depart by land. Further, it was by this man's demand that Andre changed his uniform to civilian clothing, but for which he would not have suffered the extremist penalty. Oh, well, I remember the other day. Now, the commander in chief heard of his convalescence. Andre had been captured, and a traitor had escaped. He was safely from the British lines. Turning to General Knox and myself, we were with him when he scanned the damaged papers. He cried an agony of soul. And his sonic brother, who would we trust now? for him, spoken of in the same letters of justice. Indeed, I too was a member of that court martial. And when this, this suppliant has to have his conduct placed on the same plane as the honest loyalty of British subjects and faithful Tories, he asks us to forget or perhaps to ignore that he received for his services in offering to give up West Point to the enemy a commission as a brigadier general in the British Army and gold to the amount of more than 6,000 pounds sterling. I admit I have sinned, and my passion has often betrayed me. But all is not told. I was tempted, tempted by an accursed, smooth-tongued Masonic brother. He still is honored and respected. But six months ago, I met him on the streets of London, and he passed me without a word or giving a look of recognition. Shall the tempted pay more penalty than the tempter? Will you hear the story? You recall the Battle of Quebec in December of the first year of the war. You know that the attack was led by General Montgomery, also a Masonic brother, and myself. Montgomery was killed in the fervent fire, and I was seriously wounded while leading my men over the first barricade. As I fell, a British officer leaped toward me through the swirling snow to put me to sword. In desperation, I cried aloud words that are to be spoken only in imminent peril. He diverted his sword, dragged me from the barricade, and after whispering his name and hearing mine, turned back into the Soon after, I was carried to the rear by my men. There came a later time when he reminded me of this. It is a longer story than I need to tell, or you would care to hear. But two years afterwards, while the army was wintering at Valley Forge, he met me outside our lines, and we held Masonic conversation. At the time, I debated whether to expose him to the craft, for I knew that he had an American patent with which he was gaining admission to army lodges. The patent of a Pennsylvania Mason Martin or Murdoch, or some such name, by which he had come, I know not how. But he had saved my life. When I was in command at West Point, he began the conversations that ultimately seduced me. The things he said would hardly interest you, but they were the very words needed to unsettle my loyalty. He pointed out to me that my courage and ability had never been appreciated in the Continental Army, and they had not. I, more than anyone else, won the Battle of Saratoga, and Gates was given the honor. Continental Congress was part of that. I had been court-martialed and rebuked for what was no fault of mine. I had been subordinated to officers not so able or as brave as I. He reminded me of this and many other things he said, words that inflamed my already surging heart. And he whispered that only among cultured men, 
such as the leaders of the British, would I find the recognition that I deserved, and that in British masonry, I would be honored and elevated in recognition of my true worth and talents. Well, I yielded. The meeting with Andre followed. But hear this, my punishment is greater than I reckoned, and more than I deserve. I am a Brigadier General of the British Army. When orders are to be given to me, my superiors give them. When orders are to be taken from me, my officers receive them. But neither superiors nor subordinates exchange one word with me except officially. I have no friends, no intimates, no associates. I am ostracized. Sneers follow me, then point and whisper as I pass. Masonic lodges will not admit me, and Masons will not take my hand. Yet this tempter, this vile and forsworn Mason who led me to do what I did, this man who felt himself too good to speak to me on the public street, is an honored, respected, welcome officer of the Crown, just as he was an honored senior warden of a Philadelphia Army Lodge. And his name is a lie! Ha! Bell Tower! Now, when I see you here whom I fought in England, do I really believe there is a divinity that shapes our ends? It is not a lie. In the workings of your face, these Masons can see the truth, as deep a truth as ever was spoken. There stands the man. If I had but a soul, it will overjoy me to meet you sword in hand at any time and place, you thief of honor, suborder of perjury and treason. Enough of this! No, you shall not quarrel here. No, I see, John. This is the man. This is the spy of Valley Forge. These charges are errant nonsense. Even I if there were not sufficient evidence to prove these charges, which there is, your countenance would convict you. Silence! Bell Tower, you are no longer an associate of mine. Nor shall you be in the service of His Majesty our King longer than it takes me to send the necessary dispatches. And I shall make it my duty to see that this matter comes before our British Masonic superiors, with what outcome you can judge as well as I. If I were you, I would not return to England. Nor should I remain in America. Maybe in some distant island of the sea, you might find time and place to expiate your treachery to our craft. Although I might suppose your pistol in your own hand would bring to a speedier end of misdirected life. You threaten me with no, I promise you the ostracism that was awarded this man, whose name is not spoken where Mason's congregate. You are a false man in Mason Bell Tower, a liar, a scoundrel, and a knave. With that insult, my second shall wait upon you. Any challenge from you will receive a reply. I fight it like a gentleman. If our hosts are willing, you may go. You will receive your reward for this hour's work. The war may be over, and the law may be able to do little to you for your treachery. But I shall find you. If the people of Richmond knew you were here, no power on this side of heaven would save you. They would gather and hang you from the nearest tree. I will bring you out to them, and they will tear you limb from limb. Guard well the door. Bell Tower, approach. Brother Hamilton, the Tyler Sword. You are still a Mason in name, Bell Tower. But whatever you may be when Sir Francis opposes your brother in your conduct, I do not know. But before you go, vow of secrecy. And bear in mind that the retribution of your vow is very sure. I have given my word that this man shall reach his ship unhurt. Masons everywhere will see to it that the word of Washington shall not be said at naught. Be gone.
the weak and sinful man who welcomes temptation and treason is a crime over which patient recasts no mantle of charity. But hear me, General, and men, formerly my brothers, I must speak the truth. I am overcome with shame and remorse. I am heartbroken and disconsolate. I languish in a foreign land among people who are not my people. I yearn for home. More than ever since landing on these shores, I am wishful never again to leave them. Be kind. Be generous. Be charitable. Let me come again to my own country. You have a country. You had one. It was a fair land where you were born and honorably reared. You had a flag. You had friends and fellow patriots and brother Masons. All these you chose to lose, to wreck the life that had been given you on the rocks of desperate and blind ambition. You yourself has done what has been done. And this is the price you must pay that you are a man without a country. The soil of England is not yours. The soil of America spurns your feet. You will live perhaps for many years, and through all those years you will pay that price. You may serve be it the cross of St. George, but that is not your flag. And across some rampart, or across some stretch of sunlit sea, your eyes may fall upon the stars and stripes of America, and that is most certainly not your flag. No home, no emblem to honor or revere, toward which you can look upon with devoted eyes and say, the banner of my nation. Your feet are fated to follow a dread path until they lead you to the grave. And through all your journey, your name will be a hissing and a hateful Bible. For in all the lands beneath the sun, there is no place where honest men do not despise a traitor. Freemasons will forget you, or remember you, merely to extricate you. This is a great and terrible price, but it is not too much. Brethren, do you approve of my words? I have kept my pledge to you. I have given you safe conduct here, and now you'll be reconducted to the place where you left your ship. We will never again see your face, nor will you ever again set foot on the land which you endeavored to betray.
I present to you our country's banner. Masons have died for this flag. Masons have striven for the new flag, the new country this flag represents. Masons, I doubt not, will ever prove loyal and devoted to it, and to the principle of freedom for which it stands. We are still a young and struggling people. I dream of a day when we shall be a nation, rather than a mere confederation of states. Then the United States shall truly be united, a nation one and indivisible, whose duty and delight it shall be through all centuries to exemplify to the whole world the beauty of true and perfect liberty. In the coming years, the poor and oppressed of many alien peoples will flock to this free land. It is possible that ignorance, vice, and shameful greed will seek to assail our institutions, to destroy our liberties, to poison the fountain of justice and equity. But if Freemasonry stands united in bonds of brotherhood as the stalwart defender of liberty and law, then this republic shall endure forever. General Washington gave me this at Richfield. The only uniform I ever wore with honor. Your home, your country, your flag. Dear God, I am so tired. Commander Court of Honor, Brother Chris Maxfield, well, 
soon to be Knight Commander Court of Honor. Dustin Sanders, Adam Iowa, illustrious brother Tom Moser, 33rd degree, illustrious brother Paul DeMera, 33rd degree, David Hoffman, also our treasurer, brother Pete Kishan, soon to be Knight Commander Court of Honor, Quentin, what's your name? Packer here. Sometimes it escapes me. Brother Rick Hazer, and he made it halfway down, so we'll get you back down here. Brother Phil Cole, also soon to be Knight Commander Court of Honor. These brethren that I had just mentioned, the KCCH, still get their honors in about three weeks. Well deserved for all of them. Now that Phil's up here, let's have another round of applause for these guys.